going to all, and I feel like I should say Merry Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> In case you haven't noticed, thanks. Thanksgiving and Christmas seem to be merging together as one. I'm seeing more and more Christmas trees popping up, and it's just how it is. But we're all looking for a little bit of sunshine in, in our situation that we find ourselves in. And I'm telling you, my friends, it is good to be able to come to the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. It truly is. And for those who are joining us online, we're glad you're joining us. We look forward to the day when these are gone and uh, we are able to enjoy each other's company, even have a thing called potluck. And uh, I saw the ABC actually has a face mask that printed on there, I miss potluck. <laughs> so there's something special about coming together. There really is. And uh, speaking about coming together, we are going to, next week we'll ha continue to have our Zoom prayer meeting on Wednesday evening. Tomorrow at 2.30, we are looking for people to help with decorating for uh, Christmas. So if you're available, uh, I'm going to pick on Alana, to speak to her, and uh, let her know that you're able to come. All right? Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, two things here. One, the roof project theoretically will be completed next week. It will be finished. And this is remarkable. This really is remarkable. You may have noticed that there's a new, uh, three new panes of glass up there. There was, uh, that was the, uh, the ceiling between the two uh, panes of glass had broken, so those were replaced. That was one of the ex extra expenses. Um, we saved some money by not painting the tower, so there's a little bit of offset there. We get a little bit from the conference, but there's still some monies to be raised. So as you're, as you're able and as you're led, Please continue to remember the roof fund in your stewardship planning. It's, it's a, it is a gift to ourselves and also to the future, isn't it? It's a gift to those who are coming down the road. I want to mention, too, I know it seems kind of strange to be thinking about January, but we are beginning to think about and, and plan to have a communion service the first Sabbath of January. We're trying to figure out a way to do this for those who are remote, and we believe we have a plan that's going to require some coordination and some effort, but we believe we can make it happen so that if you're not able to be with us here on site, or perhaps we're not supposed to be on site, we'll have to see what happens in January, uh, that, that we'll still be able to have communion in our homes collectively using our live stream ministry. So this is just something we're thinking about. I think we would all agree that 2021 will be, needs to be, Lord, help it to be a better year than 2020. Amen. It needs to be. And we're going to boldly pray this, not just for our comfort sake, but for the fact that it has really impacted the life of, a chur of churches. And we need this time to be able to come together and to encourage each other and share, share ideas and, and encourage each other. Uh, that covers it for our announcement. I just wanted to mention that this week the screen will come down and I found a mission spotlight and I saw that mission spotlight. I said, this is a powerful story about the power of Christian education. And we invest a lot in Christian education. There's a reason for it. It's that, that told the story about one of the reasons why we do it. Because this is a wonderful opportunity to shape and mold young people. Help them fall in love with Jesus Christ. So with that thought, I just want to invite us to bow our heads for prayer as we can begin our worship service. Father in heaven, Lord, you know we live in interesting times. And Lord, we want to thank you for the fact that you are omnipresent, you're omniscient, you know all things, you knew this was going to happen. And Lord, we thank you for the fact that you were not caught off guard by this. But Lord, this year has rattled us, in some cases, even to the core. Lord, we pray that as we worship you today, that our minds and our hearts will be lifted up into your presence. We pray, Lord, that we will have an encounter with you today. 
As we encounter each other, may we encounter you. And may we sense your presence here in this place of worship, in our homes, and of course, in our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that this will be an hour in which our minds and our hearts are totally focused upon you, upon your promises, upon your power, and your presence in our lives, and the peace that you give to us. We pray, Lord, you'll bless this worship hour with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. With gladness we are here to worship the Lord. The call for worship is found in Psalms 34. I will be reading from the New International Version, Psalm 34, verses 1 to 10. Of David, when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praises will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack good, no good thing. Amen.
to start our story, a children's story, by singing a song for the little ones at home, especially. And if you're here, you can just use your hands. And it's something very similar that everyone knows. And Sophia wanted to sing the song, so we're going to try it. Okay? You ready? Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. Little ones like me sat upon his knees. Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. Praise the Lord. Welcome everyone to Sabbath School to the Children's Corner. And we would like to greet everyone or every single child that's actually watching us and the little ones that are with us. Where are you? Can you raise your hand? Let's see how active you are. <gasps> there you are. Ooh, I see a few hands. I see a few hands. There you are. Where's Wyatt? Hi, Wyatt. Hi, little one. Ooh, look at these little ones that we have around here. Praise the Lord. Good morning, Sophia. Where's your, where's your paper? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Are you happy you're in church today? Yes. That's awesome. What is the scripture reading you have for us today? Can you read it? I will give things to you. The, I mean, Lord with all my heart, I will tell of all your wonderful needs, I will be glad and rejoice. rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. Psalms 9, 1, 2. Amen. Today we're going to talk about, because what, um, we're going to talk about Jesus lives a life of thanksgiving. Why are we going to talk about that today? Why are we going to talk about Jesus lived a life of thanksgiving? What's happening next week? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And what did SLA assign to do in the second grade class? Do you know? Are you in it? Parade. In, every, in the second grade class, we make a float and have a parade. You're going to have a little parade. What did you decide to do your float on? Um, Jesus. On Jesus. Oh, wow. And you have to make it out of scraps and toys, right? Everything that was around your, your room and around the house. So one of the things that I want to say, well, actually, I want to ask you, what are you thankful for? My family, my friends, my teachers being alive. And being alive. That's a pretty big list for a little kid, aren't you? Right? Well, I am thankful for, for being able to worship because since the age of five, I have been able to worship God by myself in church. And my mom, even though she was a very good Catholic, she allowed me to, to come to church. And that's something to be grateful for, right? To be able to do it on your own. So that's pretty cool, I think, being five years old and being able to accept Jesus as your Savior. And you know how that happened? Can I tell you real quick before we start talking about Jesus? It happened because my uncle brought me to the Seventh-day Adventist church in Puerto Rico for the first time. It was a very small Indian house, um, town called Maricao, very, very small, next to Mayagüez. And the first time that I went to that church, there was a lady there that was teaching Sabbath school, and you know what happened? You know the first thing that she did? What? She smiled at me. I was so scared to enter into a strange territory. But that smile made me happy because at that moment when I was five, I was going through turmoil during that time. It was a very tough year for me, just like 20. 20 for all, all, all of us, right, because of the coronavirus. And that smile made my heart bright and wonderful and being so thankful that I could see Jesus through somebody's smile. Do you like smiling? Yes. Very good. 
Well, you see, Jesus is such a wonderful person to talk about. And I'm going to say person because he became human so he can save all of us, so we can understand the power and God's mercy and salvation. And one of the things that, the reason why we wanted to talk about Jesus lived the life of thanksgiving, because every single time, he always responded, always by giving thanks. It reminds me of Costa Rica. No matter what, everybody says, pura vida over there. Pura vida. And everybody responds back, pura vida. It means hello, because everybody lives a happy life. So Jesus would say, thank you, Lord. So if somebody was being mean to Jesus, how many of you have heard people or seen people that are mean to you? It happens, right? We're mean, right? It happens. Even sometimes we can become mean to each other. But instead of Jesus getting upset at them, he would say, thank you, Lord. Why? Because there was a plan of salvation behind all of that. And he knew if he smiled them, he could actually change their hearts. So, there were some people, they were not mean, but he was rejoicing in God's plan. He saw the impossible being possible. Isn't that wonderful? And what kind of things, Sophia, do you have in your life that are impossible, that you don't like about you sometimes? Are you like, oh, what happened? That I'm too short. That I'm too short to do things. That I'm too short to do things. Okay. Well, I'm thankful that I'm short. Hopefully one day you're going to be thankful that you're short because I heard that small things come in small packages. Am I right, adults? Yeah? So we have to be thankful for that. But one of the things that I remember, one of the stories... It was about that Jesus was very tired and exhausted, and he wanted to find a place for him to sit down. And then people followed him, and people were hungry. And what animal did they brought? They were very, they were very scarce. Do you remember something in the water? Fish. Fish. And what item were they able to also bring? There were only very few. They were scarce. Bread. Bread. Very good. So even though Jesus was tired and the people that followed him, there was a multitude, he was thankful for fish and bread. Even though there was a few, he was able to what? He was able to multiply. He was able to multiply the food and be able to feed the crowd that followed him. Because he knew that in prayer, anything can be possible if you have faith. He also was a man of thanksgiving because of the simple fact that he knew he was going to be born and he was going to die one day. Right? And sometimes we figured that the memory of him being crucified is sad, but for Jesus, it was happiness, boys and girls. It was happiness because of the simple fact that he knew that he can provide what to all people. Salvation. Salvation to all mankind. And because of that, he knew the beginning and the end. And he knew that with him being sacrificed right at the cross, he was going to give us eternal life. And for that, we're thankful, right? So what did he do? He, before that, he broke bread, which is a representation of his body. Of his, of his body, he broke it because his body was going to be broken, right? And he gave grape juice. Grape juice or wine, yeah? And be, to represent his blood, right? Because he was going to shed his blood at the cross to actually cleanse us from all our sins. So we are definitely adoring and we are worshiping a God, right, who is merciful and he knows that even though sometimes we have our hiccups in life and we have turmoil in life, we definitely be thankful for the small stuff. And we are going through coronavirus and we can't really hug our friends or kiss them and we cannot be gathering with family during Thanksgiving. But one thing we can definitely do is be thankful that this is helping us to be more and more aware of the ends of times. So, with that in mind, we just have to remember to give a thankful prayer every single day. Would you lead us in prayer? Yes. Let us bow our heads. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. For the things. For the things that you for the things that you did for us. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for a sa sacrifice. Thank you for a sacrifice. And your love at the cross. And your love at the cross. We ask you. We ask you to continue to bless us. To continue to bless us. Not only today. Not only today. But until your second coming. But until your second coming. Amen. Amen. Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. Little ones like me sat upon his knees. Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. Happy Sabbath, everybody. As we pray, I encourage you, whether you remain to Bush to remain seated or you would like to kneel to assume the position that you find most appropriate during this time. So let us assume those and let us seek the Lord in prayer. Gracious Lord, we are grateful as Ophelia and Sophia reminded us that you love the little ones and you love the big ones too. We are grateful that you love us from start to finish and all points in between. We are grateful for this time of year that reminds us to be thankful, whether we have much or we have little, to be thankful for we serve a God and a Savior that had little when he was on this earth, yet he had so much to give because he gave of himself. And during this time, as we are grateful and thankful for all that we have, may we also find ways that we may give of ourselves to those in need. And there are so many forms of need at this time. They have been magnified by the situation we find ourselves in. Whether it's helping people out with finances, food, shelter, or even more importantly, a reminder that there are people in this world that are good and they love. As we have so many forms of communication Help us not to forget that the most important form is to actually reach out and one-on-one -on -one communicate with each other. And though it may be better to do so in person, may we find ways to do so in a manner that would remind people, Lord, that we love them and you love us. We're grateful for the blessings of this church, the fact that we have a new roof over our head, which will provide so many benefits for so many years to come. As we continue to raise for that and for our other needs, I pray that you will bless what is given, bless the givers, and multiply it, Lord, for your purpose. Help us to take advantage of this space to reach our community and to spread your love. I pray for our nation it matters not which side you may say you're on. May we say that we are together. May we truly be reminded that at the very beginning of our name is the word united. May we seek to find common ground. May we reach a helping hand instead of pointing an accusing finger. May we seek, Lord, to be a people that wants to be a city on a hill, reflecting light to a world that needs it. May we truly, Lord, work together. As a church, may we find ways, Lord, to work together. May we seek you in absolutely everything that we do. Finally, as 2020 approaches a close, and as we look forward to a better year, 
Help us not to forget that this world is not our home and that we are looking not only forward to a better time, but a far, far superior place where instead of communicating with you like this, we can do like Adam and Eve, walk with you, talk with you, and look straight into your eyes. May that day come soon, but until it does, keep us, Lord, in your care. Amen. The scripture reading is Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17, 18, and 19. If you want to follow along in the Pew Bible, it's page 764. I'll be reading from the Good News Bible, today's English version. Even though the fig trees have no fruit and no grapes grow on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no grain, even though the sheep all die and the cattle stalls are empty, I will still be joyful and glad because the Lord God is my savior. The sovereign Lord gives me strength. He makes me sure-footed as a deer and keeps me safe on the mountains. indeed blessed to have music, are we not? And I want to say that we will be closing our service today with our community bell choir, and this will be their first
public performance. And I believe it's six training sessions uh, or eight. Okay. So, so we'll be, we'll, we'll, we will leave with a true blessing. We will truly do that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you know our hearts. You know where we are this time of year with what we've been through throughout the year. And so, Lord, we want to pray that as we look at this book, that the same Holy Spirit that was with him would be with us this morning. We pray, Lord, that you will speak to us in our situations. We pray that we will continue to be a people of hope and that we will realize that, as Cameron mentioned, this world isn't our home, but we are simply passing through. We pray, Lord, that you will bless us, Lord. Speak to us here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> I like the story about a man who joined a monastery. But as part of joining the monastery, he took a vow of silence. And for a whole year, he could say nothing, nothing, except once a year, he would go into his supervisor and he could say two words. So after a whole year of silence, he goes into his supervisor and he says two words, food bad. <laughs> after another year, he can go into his, the monastery supervisor and he can, he can say two more words and he says bed hard. <laughs> Finally, three years, his, his, another three years of silence, he, he goes into his supervisor and he says two words, I quit. <laughs> and the supervisor says, that, that, that doesn't surprise me one bit. Because all you've done since you've gotten here is complain. <laughs> well, this morning we're going to look at a story, at a man who did just that. He complained to his supervisor. He complained to God. It's the book of Habakkuk. And to find that book, you're going to have to, the easiest way is to find the book of Matthew and then go backwards five books. Now, the thing about Habakkuk is he truly, truly loved the Lord. He truly did. And he, he, he yearned for the triumph of righteousness, but he was frustrated. He did not understand why God seemingly permitted the, the apostasy and the crime of Judah to go unpunished and unchecked. And so he is a man, he is a person like you and I may find ourselves today. And Habakkuk actually is a short book. It's just three chapters, and it begins with a question. Habakkuk asked the question that we ourselves ask. And he, he asked the question, verse 2 of chapter 1, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? How long must I call for help, but you do not listen? They say, do not ask the question if you're not prepared for the answer. Because God does answer. And he says, guess what? I've got things under control, and I'm going to use the Babylonians. I'm going to use the Babylonians to change the situation. Now, obviously, they are a despised people, so Habakkuk says, no thank you, Lord. No thank you. And so his prayer literally changes from change the situation, Lord, to change the way you're going to change the situation. To finally, he comes to that point where he admits, Lord, change me. Change me. A key verse in this dialogue between Habakkuk and God comes up in verse 3. I'm sorry, verse 2 of chapter 2. He says these words, and we're familiar with these words. Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that the herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and it will not delay. One commentator speaking about this insightfully noted that in due time, the acorn becomes the oak. 
the acorn becomes the oak, and the, fa- the oak. and the fact of the matter is that the church is a waiting community. We are Seventh-day Adventists. We are Seventh-day waiters. Waiting, waiting, waiting. And so he says, hang in there. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And in verse 20 of chapter 2, the Lord says something profound, or Habakkuk realizes something profound. He says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. My friends, the Lord is still in his holy temple. The Lord is still in his holy temple, even in 2020. He did not go on a coffee break when COVID-19 struck our country. He did not fall asleep at the wheel when you lost your job or a loved one. He did not blink. He did not miss that moment when something awful happened in our lives this year. He knows how it's going to end. The Lord is in his holy temple, and Habakkuk says, let all the earth be silent before him, because we know it's going, he knows how it's going to end. One theologian had a beautiful metaphor for this situation we find ourselves. He says, suppose an ocean liner is going from New York to Liverpool. From New York to Liverpool. He says, the destination has already been set. That ocean liner is going to end up in Liverpool. It's going to leave New York. It's going to end up in Liverpool. Now, what's interesting, he says, is on that cruise ship, on that ship, there are hundreds of passengers. They can take that time and they can sleep. They can eat. They can read. They can socialize. They have complete freedom. They're not in chains. They have complete freedom to do whatever they want to on that ship as it's going from New York to Liverpool. My friends, the good news is the ship is going to get to Liverpool. It's going to get there. And Habakkuk begins to understand that in one moment. He says, you know what? God is in his holy temple. Let us be silent before him. Let us be silent. And so what Habakkuk begins to do is he begins to change his focus from the woes and from his belly aching to really what God has done in the past. And he recalls in in, in Habakkuk chapter 3, he recalls the creation, he recalls the flood, he recalls the, the exodus. And he does something interesting. He changes his focus. He changes what he's focused on. My friends, we're all given 24 hours in the day. The question is, what do we focus on? Next week is going to be a different one, isn't it? Next week is going to be different. But God will take us through this and we will realize that we will be a better people as a result of it. Now, I'm saying this because Habakkuk doesn't know something that you and I know. Habakkuk doesn't know anything about the incarnation of God. Habakkuk doesn't even know about the crucifixion. He has some prophecies he can read, but he doesn't know it. He doesn't know about the resurrection of Christ. You see, he doesn't know what Paul will say in Romans 8.28. He doesn't know that all things work together for good. For them that love the Lord and who have been called according to his purpose. He doesn't know that. But you and I do. And with with his knowledge, he still says, the Lord is still in his holy temple. Let us be quiet. Recently I came across uh, the work of an entertainer named Michael J. Fox. Anybody remember him? Michael J. Fox, Back to the Future. Family ties, seemed like a nice guy, but about three decades ago, his life was turned upside down because he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Ten years after his diagnosis, he writes a book with the title called Lucky Man. Lucky Man. And on the back of the jacket, he writes these words, ten years since my diagnosis have been the best ten years of my life. 
and I consider myself a lucky man. He wrote, since then he's written other books, always looking up, a funny thing happened on the way of the future, and no time like the future. Now he says something in one of his books, he says something really, really insightful. He says, because Parkinson's demanded of me that I be a better man, a better husband, father, and citizen, I often refer to it as a gift. With a nod to those who find it's hard to believe, especially my fellow patients, he says, who are facing great difficulties, I add this as a qualifier. It's the gift that keeps on taking, but it is a gift. Habakkuk finds himself in a situation where, where, where he's upset and God says, here's what I'm going to do, and he gets even more upset. And he goes back to reset. He says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let me shut my mouth. <laughs> Let me be quiet. Because he knows something that I do not know. He knows it. Now, it's interesting, when Michael J. Fox in an interview was talking about being uh, pretty advanced in Parkinson's disease, he says one of the hardest experiences for him is to be in an airport or hotel and in a wheelchair. Now, if you remember, Michael J. Fox, very active guy, and he, sometimes he's in a wheelchair. And he says, he says when, you're, when you're in a wheelchair, usually it's a hotel employee or airport employee who's pushing you around, and all you see are people's backsides and their elbows. You can't talk to the guy because you're there and he's up there and, and there's no conversation. And he said, you know, when you're, when you're in the wheelchair, he said, you feel like a piece of luggage. And nobody talks to luggage. Nobody talks to luggage. He said these words, he said, uh, uh, if we could look each other in the eye, we'd recognize our mutual humanity. But often in the wheelchair, I'm luggage. I'm not expected to say much, just sit still so no one listens to luggage. Now I'm saying this because, interesting enough, Michael J. Fox, of course, was in the movie Back to the Future, but if we could go back to the past, we will meet someone named Jesus who stoop to our level as we are find ourselves in the wheelchair of this life, hurting, suffering, diseased, as we find ourselves in this situation, he bends down to our level. He bends down to our level, and he looks into our eyes, and we look into his human eyes, and he sees our humanity, but we see his divinity. And we see this taking place in Habakkuk's life. He's beginning to understand, wait a second here. Let me look at this a little bit differently. Let me realize that I need to shut my mouth and realize that God is still on his throne. He's still there. And so chapter 3 leads us into one of the most poetic verses of all of Scripture because in verse 16, Habakkuk says, I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound, decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Yet, yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. I believe it was Lynn Saul's who pointed me to a beautiful chapter in Ministry of Healing called Mind Cure. Mind Cure. I want to just read something there from that book. It says here, we are not to let the future, with its hard problems, its unsatisfying prospects, make our hearts faint, our knees tremble, our hands hang down. Let him take hold of my strength, says the Mighty One. Those who surrender to their lives to his guidance and to his service will never be in a place, place in a position for which he has not made provision. Whatever our situation, if we are doers of his word, we have a guide with a capital G to direct our way. Whatever our perplexity, we have a sure counselor with a capital C. Whatever our sorrow, bereavement, or loneliness, we have a sympathizing friend, capital F. It's true, isn't it? It's true. He knows where we're at. God knew where Habakkuk was. He knows the situation. And his vantage point is far different from yours or mine. And so it would behoove me to keep my mouth closed 
and trust in his guidance. John Oxman put it like this in poetry form, God's handwriting. He writes with characters too grand for our heart, for our short sight to understand. We catch but broken strokes and try to fathom the mystery of withered hopes, of death, of life, the endless war, the useless strife. But there with larger, clearer sight, we shall see this, his way was right. Habakkuk says these words, verse 16, 17, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. My friends, the fact of the matter is very few of us have fig trees. Very few of us have grape vines. Very few, I don't think any of us would have olive trees. A few have sheep, a few have cattle. But the fact of the matter is, we have all had the experience of being in lack of. Of lack of. And this is what Habakkuk understands. He says there have been times in all of our lives that the trees have been barren. That the, that the crops have failed. That the pens are empty, the stalls are empty. And we have all dealt with and we will continue to deal with disappointment and loss. And that's a simple fact. Next week on Thursday, there will be literally millions of tables in this country that will look different than last year. There will be empty chairs. There will be empty seats. There will be masks on. And things will be very, very different next, next Thursday. But God is still on his throne. God is still on his throne. And and the next day, that will also look different because we always call it Black Friday when millions of people flock to malls and Walmart and Target. That's going to look different. Not just because of social distancing and masks, but because some people's wallets are thinner this year than they were last year. But Habakkuk says something interesting. He uses a very important word three times. The word is though. (laughs) Though. Though the fig tree, though the olive crop, and though there are no sheep. He, he, He knows that even though this is a situation, I am making a decision. I am making a choice. Michael J. Fox was diagnosed, of course, with Parkinson's disease. He also has dealt with the disease of alcoholism. And in one of his books, he tells us he, saw, he, he tells this experience. He says, it's, it's all about control. And control is an illusion. He says, Parkinson's is a perfect metaphor for lack of control. Every unwanted movement in my hand or arm, every twitch that I cannot anticipate or arrest, is a reminder that even in the domain of my own being, I am not calling the shots. I try to exert control over my drinking myself into a place of indifference, which just exasperated the sense of miserable hopelessness. He says, the only way I could win was to surrender. And I took the first baby steps toward that victory by admitting powerlessness over alcohol. Habakkuk is coming to terms with the fact that the stalls are empty, The olive crops aren't coming through. The fields don't look good. The grapevines are barren. He's coming to terms with all of this. And in in the book of Habakkuk, when you do the math, there's about 60, 56 verses. And when you count them up, for 18% of those verses, Habakkuk complains. Have you ever griped to God? I hope you have. I have. And I'm going to do it tomorrow, maybe. (laughs) And maybe even today, we complain to God. Can you think of a better place, better person to complain to? And I don't care if your prayer is 18% complaining or 95% complaining. What's important is to do what Habakkuk does, which is exactly 5% of his prayer, is he makes a resolution. 
He makes a resolution in his heart. He says, though the fig trees are barren, though the crops aren't working, though the stalls are empty, yet I'm going to do this. I am going to do this. I will rejoice. I will be glad. This is what Michael J. Fox says. Part of his picture was, his journey was simply that word called acceptance. And he came upon, in his journey, he came upon a, sto- a saying that I got to share with you this morning. He says, my happiness grows in direct proportion to my acceptance. And inverse proportion, reverse proportion to my expectation. Did you catch that? Direct correlation Happiness, when you accept a situation, inverse, it works opposite. Where my expectation is to be this A, B, and C, and then guess what happens? We set ourselves up for disappointment. Habakkuk finds himself in this situation. What does he do? He says two things, twice. He says one thing twice, I will and I will. Verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. And I believe, I believe, yes, that's an amen, because I believe he's playing on words here, because it's interesting, when you look at the flow of, from 17 to 18, you'll see he talks about there's no sheep in the pen, there's no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. He's thinking so much so that you could actually go into the empty stall. You could go into the empty pen and you could still in there while you're in the Lord, you can still be joyful and you can still rejoice. You can do that even when the situation is far from perfect. Then our friend Habakkuk has this transformation and he says these words and look at how he personalized. He owns it in verse 19. He says, the sovereign Lord not will be my strength. He said he is my strength. He is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights for the director of music on my stringed instruments. My friends, we all need to take a journey. A journey which is taking our biblical information and it's a 12-inch journey to our hearts, to making it ours to making it not just theory and ideas and information and data and proof text, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but to making it my experience, your experience. Because Habakkuk does just that. He's there in the empty stalls. He sees the fields that don't look good. He sees the empty, uh, the, the, the empty uh, grapevines. He sees all that. But he makes a decision. I will rejoice. And I am going to be joyful in God. And the result is, he gives me strength, he gives me agility, he gives me strength, a power. I want to wrap up with a story about a musician that many of us are probably familiar with. Itzhak Perlman, I believe when he was three years old, he was struck with polio. You've probably seen pictures of him with his crutches and his walker. And there is one time he was giving a concert. It was the middle of the concert when, when there was that sound that everybody in the, in the auditorium understood in a moment. A string had broken. A string had popped. Perman stopped for a moment, and people thought that he would signal for another violin to be brought to him. But instead, he put the violin back to his chin and began to improvise. He was like he was playing and compromise and, and adapting the music to, to work with the, with the fact that he had one less string. Well, he played through the song, and at the end of the song, there was dead silence in the auditorium. Dead silence. When at one moment, everybody stood up and began to applaud for what they had seen, that Itzhak Perlman had finished this piece on an imperfect instrument minus one string. Everybody was clapping. Perlman told the audience to quiet down. And he said these words. He says, you know, sometimes it is the artist's task 
to find out how much music you can still make with what you have left. And how true that is. How true that is. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. And may Habakkuk's experience be our experience as well. Maybe it's too late to ask for an encore. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for the fact that you are immortal, invisible from our perspective, but we can still see your hand. We can see your thumbprints. We can see your providence. We can see your provisions. And Lord, we thank you for the peace that we have in our hearts. Lord, we want to pray that as we enjoy next week, that you will be with us as we make the best of perhaps an in, imperfect situation. We pray, Lord, that we will realize how blessed we, we are and to focus on the fact that you are on your throne. You are in your holy temple and that all we need to do is to trust that you will get us safely to our destination. You will get us to Liverpool. You will get us there. Lord, we pray that as we're doing that, that we will enjoy the journey on the ship, that we will enjoy it, that we will realize that you're at the helm, that you know how to get us to the port. We pray, Lord, that we will rest in that assurance and that confidence as we keep our eyes fixed upon you, the author and the finisher of our faith. In the saving name of Jesus Christ, we pray. 
Amen.